Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023. Lesson four from our series on Ephesians is titled, How God Rescues Us. It's ready for teaching on July 22, having been written by John McVeigh, and your reader today is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 15. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who is rich in mercy, because you love us with a love that's so great that you sent your Son Jesus that each of us could have the opportunity of salvation along with everyone else in the world as we share it. Lord, as we come before you this week, as we walk further into the book of Ephesians, we pray that we will more greatly understand how you provided that rescue operation for us and how you provided that salvation that each of us needs. And Lord, as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will make the words come to life, but also that your Holy Spirit will descend on people in many parts of the world who are listening. And today I'd like to pray for those who are visually impaired, who are listening in Hamilton, New Zealand, and Palmerston North in New Zealand, and Inala in Brisbane, and Croydon Park in New South Wales, and Avondale, two Avondales, one in New South Wales and one in Queensland, but also for those who've requested prayer for themselves. For Yonel, Jonathan Cassini, for Ezra Fabian in Bents, for Miriam Penner in the Dominican Republic and April in Jamaica, and Veronica in New York, and Milton Lewis in the Bahamas, and Emma Hernandez in Lubbock, Texas, and Debbie Longlegs in the United Kingdom. Welcome to the those who are listening, Debbie. And for Edith in Belize and Claudia Daly in Flankers. Lord, wherever people are listening today, I pray that you will bless them. May they know that you're on their side and they can walk with you. Bless us now, we pray, as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Our memory text this week is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Let's read that again, Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. On October 14, 1987, 18-month-old Jessica McClure was playing in her aunt's backyard when she fell 22 feet into an abandoned well. Her plight attracted media from around the world to Midland, Texas. A global audience watched baby Jessica sleeping, crying, singing and calling out for her mother. They watched as emergency workers piped fresh air down the well. Finally, 58 hours after Jessica's fall, the worldwide audience watched as Jessica was released from this eight-inch well casing that had trapped her for more than two days. Photographer Scott Shaw's Pulitzer Prize-winning photograph captured the moment. A rescue cable bisects the worried faces of Jessica's rescuers looking down at the bandaged bundle at the heart of the drama, Baby Jessica. There's nothing quite as gripping as a good rescue story, and Paul, in Ephesians 2, 1-10, gives us an up-close personal view of the grandest, most sweeping rescue mission of all time, God's efforts to redeem humanity. The drama of the story is heightened by knowing that we are not mere spectators of someone else's rescue, but witnesses of our own. Sunday, July 16. Once dead and deceived by Satan. Read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. What is the main idea that Paul is giving us here about what Jesus has done for us? 
And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others." But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul has already described the salvation given to Christians in Ephesians 1, 3-14 and 15-23 and told in brief the story of the believers in Ephesus in verse 13. In Ephesians 2, 1-10, Paul will now tell their conversion story in more detail with a more personal focus. He contrasts their past sinful experiences in the first three verses with the blessing of God's salvation which he portrays as a participation in the resurrection, ascension and exaltation of Christ in verses 4-7 to and he celebrates the basis of that salvation in the grace and creative work of God in verses 8-10. to These three sections of the passage are summarised neatly in the phrases of Ephesians 2 verse 5. We were dead in our trespasses. God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, Paul underlines the sad reality of the pre-conversion existence of his audience by noting that they were spiritually dead, practising trespasses and sins as their regular pattern of life in verse 1, and were dominated by Satan in verse 2. Since Paul writes to living people, he refers to them as once dead in a metaphorical sense, and will compare this with Ephesians 5 verse 14. Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. However, their plight was very real and dire, since they were once separated from God, the source of life. As we read in Colossians 2.13, And you being dead in your trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And Romans 5.17, For if by one man's offence death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. And Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Reflecting on the past lives of his hearers, Paul identifies two external forces that dominated them. The first of these is the course of this world, as he read in verse 2, the customs and behaviour in the wider society of Ephesus that misshaped human life into rebellion against God. Satan is described in two ways as the second external force that dominated their prior existence. He is, as it says in verse 2, the prince of the power of the air, since the air, or the heavenly places, is identified as the location of supernatural powers, including evil ones, as we'll read in these following verses. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing 
in the heavenly places in Christ. And Ephesians 3.10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And finally, Ephesians 6.12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Also, he is active on earth, since he is, as it says in verse 2 of chapter 2, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And so to finish today, what do these verses teach about the reality of the great controversy? At the same time, how can we draw comfort and hope in the knowledge that Jesus has been victorious and that we can share in his victory now? Monday, July 17. Once deluded by our own desires. Ephesians 2 verse 3 is our text for today and it reads... All of us also lived among them, the disobedient at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Apart from the intervention of God, human existence is dominated not only by the external forces mentioned in Ephesians 2.2, but also by internal ones, the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Let's look at three other texts here, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And we compare that with James 1 verses 14 and 15, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance. What does Paul mean by stating that his hearers were once, by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind in chapter 2, verse 3. So now we compare Ephesians 2, 3 with Ephesians 5, 6. Ephesians 2, 3. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And Ephesians 5, verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. The present reality of a lost life is distressing enough, but its last day implications are more frightening still. Human beings, being by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind in Ephesians 2.3, stand under the threat of God's judgment at the end of time. The phrase, by nature children of wrath, points to another daunting reality as well. While still bearers of the image of God, we have come to understand that there is something deeply awry in us. Living the Christian life, then, is not just a matter of conquering a bad habit or two, or overcoming whatever trespasses and sins, as it says in Ephesians 2.1, are currently threatening. We do not just contend with sins, but with sin. We are bent toward rebellion against God and toward self-destruction. Humans, by default, are caught in a pattern of self-destructive, sinful behaviour following the dictates of Satan, as we read in chapter 2, verse 2, and our own innate sinful desires in verse 3. Believers once were, by nature, the children of wrath. It is important to note that Paul employs a past tense. We were, by nature, the children of wrath, in verse 3. This does not mean that an inherent bent toward evil is no longer a reality for believers. 
Paul spends a considerable portion of his time in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17 right through to chapter 5 verse 21 warning that sinful acts rooted in a sinful nature remain a threat for Christians. It does mean, though, that this old self need no longer dominate the believer who, through the power of Christ, can put off your old self and put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness, as we've just read in Ephesians 4, verses 22 to 24. And so to finish today, Who hasn't experienced just how corrupted our own nature is, even after we have given ourselves to Jesus? What should this teach us about how important it is that we cling to him every moment of our lives? Tuesday, July 18 now resurrected, ascended, and exalted with Christ. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, Ephesians 2 verse 4. Here, with two powerful words, but God, Paul pivots from his doleful portrait of the past lives of his audience in chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 to the new hope-filled realities that mark their lives as believers in verses 4 to 10. In what sense do believers participate in Christ's resurrection, ascension and exaltation? And when does this participation occur? Ephesians 2 verses 6 and 7 And raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We have noted that Ephesians is a Christ-drenched letter highlighting the solidarity of the believers with Christ. In Ephesians 2, 5 and 6, Paul extends this theme by deploying three compound verbs to unleash the stunning truth that, through God's initiative, believers themselves participate in important salvation history events that centre on the Messiah, Jesus. Let's read those two verses again, Ephesians 2, verses 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us to sit together in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. Believers are, one, co-resurrected with Christ, two, co-raised up with Christ, which Paul probably uses to indicate the participation of believers in Christ's ascension to heaven, and three, co-seated with Christ in heavenly places, meaning that believers participate in Christ's seating on the throne of the cosmos. They are so exalted with Jesus. To appreciate the power of Paul's argument, we must look back to Ephesians 1, 19-23 and recall that in his death, resurrection, ascension and exaltation, Christ gains the victory over all evil and spiritual powers, the very ones who once dominated the lives of the believers. Let's read Ephesians 1, 19-23. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In the resurrection, ascension, and exhortation of Jesus, these powers, though still active and threatening to human existence, have been thoroughly superseded. 
The cosmos has shifted. Reality has changed. Believers are not mere spectators to these events, but are personally and intimately involved in them. That we are co-resurrected, co-ascended and co-exalted with Jesus opens up a whole new array of possibilities for us. We have the right to turn from a demon-dominated existence to a life of spiritual abundance and power in Christ, as we read in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so to finish today, we'll reread 2 Timothy 1 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How do the verses we looked at today help us understand what Paul writes here? Wednesday, July 19. Now blessed forever by grace. Compare God's planning for salvation in Ephesians 1, 3 and 4 with the eternal results of that plan described in Ephesians 2, verse 7. What are essential elements and goals of God's plan of salvation? Ephesians 1, 3 and 4 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And then we compare that with Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Graduation ceremonies are wonderful celebrations, whether for kindergarten or a PhD. A graduation marks an important accomplishment, the move to a different stage of life or career. It is important for us as believers to understand a profound truth of the gospel. We never graduate from grace. There is never a celebration that we have attained our PhD in grace or graduated from our need of it. Paul affirms this truth in Ephesians 2.7, accenting it with an expansive chronology. God has acted in the past in Christ to redeem us, so identifying us with his Son, Jesus Christ, that we are in the present co-participants in his resurrection, ascension, and exaltation, as we read in Ephesians 2.4-6. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God's plan, though, does not end with a grace-filled past and a mercy-bathed presence. God's plan, rooted in divine counsels in time immemorial, as we read earlier in Ephesians 1 verse 4, stretches forever into the future. It includes all the coming ages, as we just read in Ephesians 2 and verse 7. His plan for the eternal future is founded on the same principle as his actions in the past and present, the principle of grace. Ephesians 2, 7 reads in the ESV, In the coming ages, God looks forward to demonstrating the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Paul thinks of God's grace as a treasure or fortune of unfathomable value. As we compare Ephesians 1 verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, with chapter 3 and verse 8. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, from which believers may draw to meet any need. 
This grand generosity of God toward us becomes an eloquent, ageless and cosmic exhibit of His grace. And so we finish today by reading from The Desire of Ages, pages 19 and 20. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. But not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look, and it will be their study throughout endless ages. Both the redeemed and the fallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. End of quote. Thursday, July 20. Now saved by God. Read back through Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 10, focusing on Paul's conclusion in verses 8, 9 and 10. What points does he highlight as he concludes the passage? Let's start at verse 1. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others." But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For... As it says in verse 8, By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. In verses 1 to 3, Paul documents that the salvation of the believers in Ephesus does not occur because of their good behaviour or winsome qualities. When the story begins, they are spiritually dead. There's not a spark of life or worth in them, as it said in verse 1, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses in sin. They have been utterly conquered by sin. They exhibit no personal initiative, but are led around by Satan himself and by their own base passions and mental delusions. Verses 2 and 3. In which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Unknown to them, they are in a far worse position than simply being without spiritual life or virtue. In company with all mankind, they are the enemies of the true God and are moving toward a day of destiny and divine judgment. They are children of wrath like the rest of mankind, as it said in verse 3. Instead of being rooted in their own qualities, their salvation is rooted in God's inexplicable love, a love that cannot be explained based on any worth in the object of that love. In mercy and love, God acts on their behalf in Christ Jesus, it says in verse 4, resurrecting them from spiritual death. Because of God's intervention, they experience an amazing itinerary that follows the trajectory of Jesus himself. 
From the extreme depth of utter spiritual death and grinding slavery, they are resurrected and conveyed to the heavenly places and seated with Christ on the cosmic throne, as we read in verses 5 and 6. This lightning-like divine intervention, though, is no momentary phenomenon. It has real staying power, eternal durability, because God intends to exhibit His grace toward them in Christ Jesus throughout all eternity, as it said in verse 7. In its conclusion, in verses 8 to 10, Paul goes back over this ground, wishing to ensure that his point sticks. The salvation of believers is a divine work, not a human one. It does not originate in us, but in God's gift. No human being can boast of having sparked it. We read in verses 8 and 9, Standing in the grace of God, we believers are exhibits of His grace and only of His grace. We are His masterpieces created by God, as it says in verse 10, in Christ Jesus. And so to finish the day, why is it so important for us to understand that our salvation is from God and not rooted in our own worth or efforts? Friday, July 21. Further thought. Underlying the epistle to the Ephesians is a story that is often rehearsed in part or alluded to in it. The major events in the narrative are the following. 1. God's choice of the people before the foundation of the world. We find that in Ephesians 1 verses 4, 5 and 11. 2. Their past lost existence, we read about at the beginning of chapter 2 and towards the end, chapter 4 towards the end, and chapter 5, verse 8. 3. The intervention of God in Christ to save them, we read in the first chapter, the second chapter, the fourth chapter, the fifth chapter. 4. Their acceptance of the gospel. We read about that in chapter 1, and it's implied elsewhere in that chapter. Having once no hope in chapter 2, they now possess the one hope toward which believers move in chapter 4 and chapter 1. And 5. The present lives of the addressees as disciples, though living at a time fraught with hazards and the opposition of the evil powers, they may draw on the resources offered by their exalted Lord, as you read in Ephesians 1, 15-23, chapter 2, verse 6, chapter 3, verses 14-21, to 21, chapter 4, verses 7-16, to 16, and chapter 6, verses 10-20. to 20. And six, in the future culmination of history, the Spirit's role as guarantee we find in Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14, or seal in chapter 4 verse 30, reaches fruition. In this crowning moment, the addressees will be rewarded for their faithfulness by taking possession of the inheritance already granted to them in Christ, as we've read in chapter 2, and we'll read later in chapter 6. And, through their faith in Christ, they will be granted a place in the Christ-centred age to come. We read that in chapter 1, 21, 2, 7, 2, 19 to 22, chapter 4, verses 13 and 15, and chapter 5, verse 27. And that brings us to our discussion questions for this week. 1. The underlying story of Ephesians is not just the story of believers in the first century. It is our own story. Which of the major steps or stages of that story gives you the most hope in this moment? 2. Why do you think it is that Paul so frequently recalls the sinful past of his audience, inviting them to reflect on their pre-conversion lives? 3. Compare Paul's summary of the Gospel in Ephesians 2, 8-10 to his earlier summary in Romans 1, 16 and 17. What similar themes emerge? In what ways are they different? Let's have a look. Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, 
nor of works, lest any one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then Romans 1, beginning at verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. And four, while the good works of believers play no role in their redemption, in that they can never give people saving merit before God, what important part do they play in God's plans for believers? Ephesians 2 verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And for today's inside story, here's Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Terrified in Russia, Part 1 by Andrew McChesney Unusual events began occurring at home after 16-year-old Almira signed up for courses on the supernatural in the Russian Republic of Bashkortostan. The year was 1992. The Soviet Union had collapsed the previous year and public interest was high in once-banned religion. Two Russians from Moscow showed up at Almira's school in the city of Sibay and offered extracurricular courses on extrasensory perception. Almira's parents forbade Almira from attending the courses. The Russian teachers, however, promised to reveal amazing secrets, including how to heal illnesses. Mother had suffered headaches for some time and Almira wanted to help her, so she secretly attended the courses. She was taught that she was surrounded by invisible good and evil forces and, if she mastered them, she could perform wonders. Alone at home, she attempted to put into practice what she was learning. She carried out a one-sided conversation with unseen forces in her home, saying that she wanted to control them. That night, when she turned off the light to go to bed, she sensed a presence in the room. After a while, the presence manifested itself during the day when she was at home alone. Sometimes she noticed a shadow running past a window. She was not afraid. She thought that she was strong and was on her way to controlling an invisible force. As time passed, she realised to her chagrin that the force was stronger than her. She could not control it. Frightened, she stopped turning off the lights when she went to bed at night. She was afraid to sleep. When she finally slept, she had terrifying nightmares. In desperation, Almira asked Mother to sleep with her, but Mother refused after a few days. She said she was having nightmares. Over the next six months, Almira's life turned upside down. Her grades suffered and she seemed to be in constant conflict with teachers, friends and her parents. She grew terrified. She didn't know where to turn. You can read more about Almira next week. Thank you for your mission offerings that help spread the gospel in Russia and around the world. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Kurumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born initially read as Eyes for the Visually Impaired through Christian Services for the Blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. 
It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Cyberschool app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, remember, God is always faithful.